My name is Sherry Neely, and I am a student at Lenore Ryan University Asheville Center for Graduate Studies in the Master of Community Co College Administration program. I started out this presentation on the Affordable Care Act and community colleges with the intention of showing how the ACA is negatively impacting the community college's ability to effectively teach students. But what I found out was that the overuse of part-time faculty was already negatively impacting student outcomes and that the ACA is simply augmenting that problem. So let's start out with a brief description of what the Affordable Care Act is and why that is impacting community colleges. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, or ACA for short, is the new health care reform law in America, and it's often called by its nickname, Obamacare. For the for purpose of this presentation, I will just refer to this act as the Affordable Care Act, or ACA for short. The purpose of the ACA is to reform the health care system by providing more Americans with affordable, quality health insurance and to simultaneously curb the growth in health care spending in the U.S. The Act itself is a long, complex piece of legislation. There's a total of 10 titles in the Act, and each title has a subsection, and then each subsection has even more subsections. So while the law itself is difficult to read, most of what the average person thinks of as Obamacare is contained in the first title, which is Quality Affordable Health Care for All Americans. So maybe you're wondering what this has to do with colleges. Well, there's a section that is called the Employer Mandate and it's officially a part of the employer shared responsibility provision. The purpose is to encourage and require employers to offer health insurance benefits to their employees. And there's a tax penalty of $2,000 per employee for failing to comply. All employers who have 50 or more employer, employees are required to participate by providing health insurance to their employees who work 30 hours or more per week. And it's not just based on full-time employees, it's based on full-time equivalents. So for every 120 hours of part-time labor, that would count as one full-time equivalent. Most community colleges, as employers of more than 50 employees and faculty, would then be affected by the employer mandate. And that's where the problem begins. According to data from the United States Department of Education, of the nearly 1.8 million faculty members and instructors who made up the 2009 instructional workforce, 75.5% were employed as part-time or adjunct faculty members. How could community colleges afford to take on that many more health benefits for part-time faculty members? And then the problems further compounded because community college adjuncts are typically paid by the course rather than by the hour. So in order to figure out whether or not an adjunct is eligible for health benefits, we have to consider the hours required outside of the face-to-face -face teaching time with students to develop courses, to prepare for class, grade papers, meet with students, and so forth. Colleges have never had to track how many hours were required to teach a course because this was just not how the pay was structured. So now they have to put some metrics to it. And now we are beginning to see a storm cloud brewing. In fact, it's a perfect storm cloud in the making as four distinct variables converge, crashing into one another and undermining the master plan. First, President Obama set a very ambitious goal, which we call the completion agenda, that by 2020, America will once again have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world. Now, currently the U.S. ranks 12th place globally in degree completion, so moving to first place is going to take a lot of effort. In fact, degree completion in the United States is alarming, with a very large percentage of students entering colleges who do not graduate. 
Next, running counter to the Obama 2020 goal is the nationwide economic recession, which has already caused a majority of states to cut spending on public education, leaving them to scramble to find the means to serve the growing student population. Funding being reduced then undermines the goal to increase degree production. And the impact on the ground can be felt by students in the form of reduced support services, such as reduced uh, tutoring services, reduced library hours, and the elimination of free printing for students. These reductions in services create really unfavorable conditions for degree completions for students who depend on the library for their computer access and for printing their assignments. And reducing the number of courses offered can result in a student not being able to enroll in a course that's needed to complete a degree, either because it's no longer offered, maybe it's not offered in the semester that the student needs to take it in, or maybe it's in conflict with the student's work hours, forcing them to choose between the job and a school commitment, sort of in a catch-22. And then we have the over-reliance on part-time adjunct faculty, which we're going to discuss some more in upcoming slides. And when we couple all of this together with the employer mandate as part of the ACA, what we're looking at here is a perfect storm headed straight for the community colleges in the United States. Now, there is one addendum that has been made to the ACA, and that's called the Healthcare and Education Reconciliation Act. This addendum increases Pell Grant funding, and it provides additional funding to institutions serving minorities, but it really does nothing to eliminate or alleviate the problem with the ACA's employer mandate. So, what will colleges do? Well, let's just look at this one piece at a time. The first reaction is a self-defense survival one. To avoid the steep penalties for failing to comply, community colleges are first scrambling to define what full-time employment looks like and to ensure that the adjuncts are not eligible for benefits because it's just simply unaffordable. From an administrative perspective, although the preference would be to provide those extended health benefits, Reducing the hours worked by an adjunct faculty is, is just the path that makes the most financial sense. But we have to ask, are we winning a battle just to lose the war? Are we undermining the mission of the community college to provide our students with an affordable, quality education? The IRS has not provided a, fun, a formula to calculate the workload of adjuncts, simply advising colleges to use a reasonable method for crediting hours of service and adding that it would not be reasonable to take into account only the classroom or instruction time and not the other hours that are necessary to perform the employee's duties like class preparation time. Yet by limiting the number of hours adjuncts can work as a way to evade penalties, universities are just basically reversing the intent of the ACA in the first place. Some universities have cut the number of courses that adjuncts are allowed to teach. Some have used a ratio to determine how many hours are needed outside the classroom for every hour spent inside it. And others are adopting their own solutions. At my own institution, for example, a ratio is being used. For curriculum adjunct instructors, instructors, the ratio is 1 to 2.4, meaning for each credit hour instructed, it's anticipated that the adjunct will spend 2.4 hours outside the class. With this ratio, the number of credit hours an instructor may teach is limited to 12. For continuing education instructors, that ratio is 1 to 1.4, which limits Con Ed instructors to 20 face-to-face -face hours per week. The natural response of citizens who do not work in education might logically be, well, let's just make more of the adjuncts full-time then, and then reduce the overall number of adjuncts that we use. Well, that's easy to say, but hard to do. Let's look at some of the reasons that community colleges rely heavily on part-time faculty to start with. First, it saves the college money on salaries and benefits. Budget cuts leave us with only two choices, either raise tuition or cut costs. And personnel is by far the largest budget category, accounting for as much as 75% of total expenditures for some colleges. Employing part-time faculty allows two-year colleges to cut costs dramatically and quickly because part-time faculty members make up to 35% less than their full-time counterparts, and plus, it saves on benefits and office space. 
and also permits greater flexibility at the start of the semester when course enrollments are not known until the day before the semester begins. This allows community colleges to staff up for heavy enrollments and to slack off for lighter ones on short notice as needed. Part-time faculty then are basically being used to plug holes. It also allows the college to offer a larger variety of vocational and technical programs at a low cost. So then what's the problem? Well, I am glad you asked. The adjunct faculty member ends up as expendable, and this leads to all sorts of domino effects. First, the adjunct has limited or no job security. It also leads to poor hiring and recruitment practices. Sometimes the adjunct is hired at the last minute, leaving little time to prepare for instructional delivery. In addition, part-time adjunct faculty earn significantly less per course than their full-time counterparts, as you can see from this graphic representation. And this leaves adjuncts no other option but to teach at multiple locations in order just to make ends meet. Furthermore, adjuncts are often left out of instructional orientations and professional development opportunities, and there's frequently no formal evaluation process. They're not involved usually in curriculum planning, textbook selection, and faculty meetings. They lack office space, clerical support, and instructional materials. Some adjuncts has com have complained that students are not well served when adjuncts lack a private office in which to meet or when phone extensions are unassigned so adjuncts receive only voicemail and not direct calls. This situation could leave adjuncts at risk of violating rules and regulations associated with the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act or FERPA by holding confidential discussions with students in public areas. For adjunct faculty, the blow is twofold. Cutting hours to avoid paying for health benefits quashes the hope of receiving employer assisted health insurance, while at the same time cutting income for those who previously taught a larger course load. And now they'll be mandated under the ACA to purchase their own health insurance, which they can less afford on a lower salary. They are largely unrecognized and underrewarded the near invisible faculty. Several adjuncts have begun blogging. Let's hear from a few. Bill Lipkin of the adjunct faculty writes, don't they realize how little most of us make and how difficult it is to survive now, much less recommending that we reduce our pay? I have members on food stamps and close to homeless. We had an adjunct last summer that lived in the faculty lounge on one campus after he was evicted from his apartment for non-payment of rent. Security discovered this towards the end of the semester and he was out on the street. We educate most of the college students in the USA. We need to be recognized for our work and not be forced to suffer these unintended consequences. And Harvey Whitney, Whitney Jr. from Swan's Commentary writes, so, in the goal to provide universal health coverage, the Affordable Care Act has seemed to have done the opposite in allowing states and colleges to do two things. One, to limit adjunct faculty working hours, and two, to reduce the ability of adjunct faculty to pay for their health insurance. Unfortunately, students will also bear the brunt of this policy because adjuncts will be forced to teach over state lines in order to earn more. The travel alone will make for a less energized teacher in the classroom. Additionally, colleges might hire more adjuncts who, because they might teach only one class, feel disengaged from the students. And that leads us to the most important issue, and that is, how does the use of part-time faculty impact student outcomes? According to research conducted by Daniel Jacoby, heavy reliance on part-time faculty significantly alters and negatively impacts student outcomes. There's also a significant negative relationship between exposure to part-time faculty and the student's chances of transferring to a four-year institution. Even first-year students are less likely to persist into the second year as exposure to part-time faculty increases. Jacoby also noted that student persistence improves with increased social and academic integration, but the reduction in support services limits the student's opportunities to do this. 
Part-time instructors are less available to the students, relying on expediency to accomplish tasks, often keeping their course materials in the trunk of the car as they commute to multiple campuses. Some students say they're late to class and they're more likely to cancel at the last minute. Full-time instructors are also affected. As adjunct hours are cut to avoid paying penalties, institutions look to the full-time faculty to pick up additional classes. And the full-time faculty are also tapped to pick up duties required outside the classroom, like serving on committees, planning and purchasing curriculum, scheduling classes, and so forth. And that limits their availability to students as well, not to mention raising stress levels. How are adjuncts reacting to the news that their hours may be cut to avoid paying their health insurance? While well, morale is poor and tensions are escalating on campuses around the country, the blogosphere is buzzing with activities. The Ohio Part-Time Faculty Association, formed to support collective bargaining rights for adjuncts, staged its first protest after the University of Akron announced that it was limiting adjunct hours because it cannot afford to take on millions of dollars more in health care costs. Maria Maestro, president of the new faculty majority, was invited to testify to these issues at a November 14th House Committee on Education and the Workforce on the effects of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act on schools, colleges, and universities. In response to that, House Representative George Miller, Democrat from California, has promised to begin deeper investigation into the adjunct faculty working conditions by collecting stories and information through an e-forum. That e-forum is now available and you can see the website here on this slide. So we've now established that the ACA does have unintended consequences. It is exposing community colleges to increased financial risk through legal action by adjunct faculty or through steep fines imposed by the employer mandate. In addition, reducing adjunct hours will likely only increase student exposure to part-time faculty as community colleges fill in the gaps left by the reduction in hours with even more part-time faculty or maybe even overburdened full-time faculty. So this move will only further hamper faculty performance and negatively impact student learning. And that's a direct contradiction to the completion agenda. And the biggest threat is to the overall mission of the community college as a whole to provide affordable quality education to our students. What can community colleges do to manage the risk associated with this perfect storm? Well, let's examine some of the key points of problems raised and let's get started there. Uh, community college leaders should voice their concerns to members of legislation and seek legal counsel to protect the institution. Deliberate consideration should be given to the use of part-time faculty in light of the overall mission and purpose of the community college. Next, institutions should encourage collective responsibility by all faculty and leadership to ensure quality instruction and appropriate student learning are taking place. Regional accreditation can and should encourage institutions to develop and implement guidelines on the use of part-time faculty, holding them accountable for demonstrating that the use of adjuncts is contributing to the overall quality and rigor of undergraduate education and student learning outcomes. Senior leadership should meet regularly with all vice presidents, deans, department chairs, full-time and part-time faculty to discuss roles, responsibilities, and rewards of part-time faculty at the institution for the purpose of preserving an institutional culture that embraces adjunct faculty as credible, legitimate members of the teaching profession, giving adjuncts a voice in governance and decision-making. Failure to create a culture that enables part-time faculty to be effective undermines the integrity of the institution. So we need to look at what community colleges can do to ensure the effectiveness of their adjunct faculty. Adjuncts must be given the tools that they need to be successful, such as defined 
uh, define specific syllabus, course objectives, and outcomes, and adjuncts should be held accountable for adhering to these, maybe by asking them to sign a contract to follow course specifics. Second, expectations should be clarified and made explicit to both full and part-time faculty. Institutions could establish a program to train adjuncts and full-time faculty to understand the classroom environment and learning styles. Adjuncts should teach because they like to teach and because they can teach, not just to earn a paycheck. Third, colleges should institute a method, a method to allow better availability of adjuncts to students outside the classroom and then to create opportunities for peer connections. Part-time students, in particular, spend less time on campus and have less opportunity to make social and academic connections. They are also at increase for dropout due to the extended time required to complete a degree. Administrators should think outside the box to streamline the educational pipeline and encourage students to persist. Fourth, institutions should create incentives to encourage adjunct faculty to engage with the campus and to spend time with their students in hopes of mitigating the negative relationship between exposure to part-time faculty and student success. Positive outcomes for students could include networking and mentoring opportunities. And finally, a feedback mechanism should be provided to ensure that effective teaching and learning are in fact taking place. There is a lot to think about. There are many variables coming together at the same time, including budget cuts, the economic recession, the pressure from the completion agenda, scheduling flexibility, an over-reliance on part-time faculty, and now the Affordable Care Act and employer mandate. Calming a storm of this magnitude takes time, persistence, and most of all, it takes collaboration. The resolution of this will require the voice of every member of the educational system, the political and government systems, and the community at large. The storm must be examined from every angle because every action will create an equal and perhaps opposite reaction. So every step must be taken with extreme caution. All of us should let our voices be heard and speak up about how we are impacted no matter where we fall in the continuum of the Affordable Care Act. Bringing a problem out into the open is the way to create golden opportunities for change. Thank you for joining me as we explore how the Affordable Care Act is impacting community colleges. There are a lot of references here and they will go into the second page. Thank you.